will be home. Are we going to do a honor system now? We're going to say, oh, we're going to allow these people to do this, this, and this, and this, this, and this, but they're going to ensure us, every single resident of Summerfield is going to be home when their renters or their two people and their four people who turn into ten people who turn into the bonfire. We all know we've been there. We've rented Airbnbs. So let's just put that out there. How do you enforce that? When you say, oh, we're going to ensure that the homeowner's going to be home. Are you going to go and drive around to every person that has one of these? Or are we just going to say, oh, everybody's just going to do right? You know, I don't think human nature, nature sadly, that that's how this is going to be. You know, that's like asking a child to say, you, you know, wash your face, you know, do all these things you're supposed to do, but I don't need to supervise you because you know what you're supposed to do. We all know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do what's right. So I'm, I'm questioning how do, you, how do you plan on enforcing Brad, since you don't even have an enforcement officer, <laughs> to, to go around every person that, that does this and say, are you home? Am I supposed to be home? Is that my job now is to babysit my renters? The second thing I want to say is, um, you know, how is it that um, you can, you can uh, say to other, other, other neighbors, you know, we're going to do this and this is going to be okay and it's not going to affect your property value, right? Like, I'm not against people making money or profiting, but money is great for, for all kinds of reasons, right? But, but how is it that you can say that this is not the reason and that every single person is going to, you're going to say, well, there's a, a little sign and, and what if I miss the sign? What if I miss your little change? You know, I, I miss all of this, you know, and that's really making me mad. But what if I'm not going to see, are we supposed to police the neighborhood and say, oh my gosh, they don't buy? You know, I mean, there's so many things that we are not aware of and, and cannot, will never be aware of until somebody's building it next door to you on your property line. And I know about setbacks, because my husband's an engineer, and I know about all of this, but when I look at my backyard, Gary Brown is my back door neighbor, right? Beautiful, gorgeous land. I'm so fortunate to live where I live. But on each side of me, what will I do if both of my neighbors decide to have, what about their parking? What about their cars? What about the firemen and their dogs? Because you know, everybody's going to want to bring their dog. You know? So just the idea that this is just the simple amendment that people are just going to be okay with, I, I really think is, is really hard for, for someone like me you know, to understand. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Have you all done? on a 5805 Stumpo Drive. When I read the report from the planning board, I had the impression they were trying to find some compromise um, in that recommendation. This is a charming property. This is, this is just a charming property. Brad offered um, just excellent, an excellent presentation on checks and balances. I'm not sure that they're in the UDO. Remember, the UDO had no public hearing. And there were a lot of things in the UDL that were never, that you never had any extra um, expertise or public input. So there are concerns. Fire department would be one. Um, how do they get, how do they get back there? Um, that would be one. But um, I think, I think the things that Brad, Brad seems to be right on target, that maybe you need to just step back and and define this so that it's it's going to be workable, and so that the homeowner doesn't have any problems down the road. We want them to be able to do what they want because it's going to be a charming piece of property. Thank you. Beth Cap. First, Ms. Dunham, it is in the UDA. Beth Cap on seventy nine seventy nine. It's an accessory. It's a detached accessory accessory dwelling, which we already allow in the UDA. We already have Airbnbs in Somerville. We're already allowing short-term short rentals in the UDO that are attached. So if she just drew a thing across and attached it to the house, it would be allowed. She's asking for permission. She technically could do it without permission, build an accessory dwelling, rent it. 
it's going on all the time. She's doing the right thing. I think we should be neighborly and at least, you know, permit it so we can control it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll give you a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> This lady has, has got a beautiful plan here, but I, and I'm not against anybody doing it too much, but I thought we had this part of a single family dwelling. I didn't know it could be changed. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't, thank you. I didn't, this lady, has, has, has got a beautiful lady out there. I mean, she's changed chicken into beauty, you know what I mean? You can read between the lines what I'm trying to say. As far as she's decorated this place with inside. And I'm not against anybody making money, honest money, that is. But I thought that, well, I know when I built my house, they told me it was a single family dwelling. They didn't tell my house got five bedrooms in. But they told me, hey, no, no, no. When I built my house, of course, you know, times have changed in 56 years. But uh, that's all I got to say. I mean, I don't know what we're strained or that to swallow a camel for, uh, but it's either right or wrong, or we might have to rezone or do something. I, mean, I don't think I could go out there. I mean, I got seven acres. I don't think I can go out there and put two or three places up when, uh, if I wanted to. I mean, that's just what I, I'm asking the question. Uh, I hate to so much trouble. But, I mean, this lady's got a vision. I hand it to her. She's got another beautiful place out of nothing. But I, I mean, I just don't think it fits into our, our plan is a time right now. I know we're trying to get apartments and everything else here by one of our land developers. And thank God my group here is working to try to stop that. And I thank you for it. If I said something that's right, I apologize for it. Oh, I didn't get to say something like that. First time I've been back in the building since y'all were done it. It was pretty nice. I thank you for your help. Again, and I uh, y'all have a great day. I'll thank get you this paper. Anyone else? We will uh, close the time of public hearing and uh, take this matter to the council to now the council has questions, uh, discussion, and conversation. <laughs> So, Brad, just a couple things of clarification, and I think it's Kathleen for saying that. We, we do already allow short-term rental. It's already in our UDO to an attached dwelling. So I just want to clarify that. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of the sewer and electrical, even if it's independent, it still has to be inspected. Or if they add it to their house, it still has to go through the same permitting and vetting process. So I want to clarify that. Right, so if they add it to their house as it is, it's the kind of the swap you want to make sure the septic that's there to handle the extra. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then secondly, it's been a while, but I thought special use was the time frame. Doesn't it have to be renewed after a year or something? Or? Not anymore after 2018, I think, if that's right, Scott. Um, the council then voted to change that, right? Well, yeah, that was on one particular case. Uh, that was right. Well, I don't think we've got any kind of time limitation on special use permits as a general rule in the UDF. Right. Okay. We have, with, with this, we, for this use, we have an annual inspection requirement, which right. is, is different. And, and Brad mentioned earlier, because we haven't dealt with this specifically for accessory dwelling units, if you uh, were to pass it, uh, you mentioned not sure how we would handle that. What we would do is uh, I, I think from the time that special use permit went in place, we would just calendar that uh, for inspection the following year, and we would just have to internally track that and, and do those as they come online. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just remember we were doing a rewrite. I thought it was like a year and it had to be a year. Okay. So it's, um, all right, and then lastly, I recall, and I think it's not a bad you wanted to mention, there was a bill going through about this. To allow this, do we have an update on that? We, we no, that's our favorite. <laughs> I took a look. I've been spending a lot of time on the General Assembly website recently, but I, I don't have to. But 
I did take a look, and there were two bills. One was introduced in March, one was introduced in April in, in the House. I think they were both in the House. That were going to uh, the state was going to regulate short-term rentals to some extent, basically not allow local governments to prohibit short-term rentals and like. Both of those two bills are stalled; they haven't crossed over, so I don't think there's going to be any action on them in this session of, of the Assembly, General Assembly. But there, there definitely is consideration of limiting local governments' ability to regulate short-term rentals. We just don't know when it's going to happen, and we don't know exactly what the limitations will be. There's a lot of questions these days. All right, thank you. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. And I'd like to add one other thing that was brought up in, uh, in public comments, and our attorney can speak more to it if needed, but uh, regarding a neighborhood's uh, uh, restrictive covenants or HOA uh, restrictions, uh, the town really doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah, even, even if we said that uh, <coughs> short-term rentals in detached accessory dwelling units is okay. We said that as a matter of the town of Summerfield's zoning regulations. If the covenants for that subdivision say that you can't have that, then you can't have it unless you get some kind of relief from your HOA, from the covenants in the HOA. So um, we do not enforce covenants for property owners associations. The association does that, or the members of the association can do that. So they're, they're kind of two separate regulatory uh, processes. Uh, one is private through the HOA, and the other is the public process through the, through the tech. Uh, well, in that same vein, I had a question I wanted to ask that actually uh, came from a citizen that lives over there. Uh, it says all lots on Winter Farm Road and LaRue Court were sold with specific restricted covenants, which go with the land, not the ownership. These restricted covenants have automatically renewed. Uh, they would not allow an Airbnb such as this usage. Uh, so is that what we're referring to? Yeah, I, I, I have looked at the covenants, the Trotter Bridge, and they're your permissible uses on the lots are single family residential dwelling units. Okay? And unless those covenants are changed, this is my opinion, and Ms. Bond, you can go and yeah. seek your own counsel if you need right. to. But uh, I'm not sure that in Trotter, was it Trotter? Yes. I, don't, I don't think the covenants allow. Uh, either short-term rentals or single-family detached uh, accessory dwelling units. Right, they don't have to allow those at all. So, but again, we don't enforce those. Right, but the, the big question here is, do we want to allow them throughout town, at, irrespective of this one situation? That's correct. Yeah, that's really, I was going to say that before too, that's really a consideration for the board is to think about you can't be focused just on this application because this may be a great, conceptually great application, but you've got the other 26 square miles of town where this possibly could happen. That uh, if you approved it, it'd have to be conscious of. Further discussion. So just to clarify, in this particular situation, not the whole town. Just the covenants don't allow an STR or the tax bill, correct? That was my reading of it, yeah. Okay. All right. Um. But I would also say just, just because we don't allow it, um, or just because we do allow it, doesn't mean it's allowed. It's got to be permitted by the covenants also. Right. Of that neighborhood yes. or any other neighborhood. Yes. Right, and just the, so, so like, excuse me, so for instance, I'm not doing this, but I don't live in a neighborhood, so if we did this type of thing, then that would be like on me. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 And, and I'm sorry, I was just going to say, uh, and if we allowed something, if, if we allowed those 
short-term rentals, accessory dwelling units uh, that are detached um, in our ordinance. And right now, some neighborhoods' restrictive covenants or HOA did not allow it, meaning they ultimately couldn't do it. Well, those covenants and restrictions in that same number, neighborhood uh, could, um, I just lost my word, could um, end. <laughs> What's the word? Expire. 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 They could expire, let's say, three years from now. Not in this particular case, but at some point they could expire, and suddenly that situation where those covenants restricted them now opens it back up because our ordinance allows it. And also, it's a very long shot, but most covenants have a mechanism by which the covenants can be amended. Usually, that requires a supermajority vote of 70 or 80 percent of the owners in, in the uh, subdivision for which the covenants, for which the covenants apply. And I, in my experience, and I've, I've been practicing, I, I've never seen 80 percent of the owners in the neighborhood agree on anything. <laughs> So, I just don't see that happening. There, there was, yeah. this question is just for staff. I'll take offense, but just to clear the air. Um, there were public notices sent out on time into, within that uh, distance. I don't remember the distance that it was supposed to, correct? So, just for text moment, you only have, for state statute, you only have notice in the paper. All right, that's fine. I just want to make sure that everybody knows we did our due diligence. Right. We're, we're good. Okay. And then this was another question. Each time an STR came up, it would have to go in front of the BOA before the document, correct? Each time an STR for a detached, or is it all a STR? Okay. So we have the STR. All right. Um, okay. So we're talking about short-term rentals. I'm trying to understand the difference. But then you said they could become like a resident. Would you call it a D, a D, or something? So where where is that fine line? Because when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at short-term rentals and let's say a future development is done and um, your water will occur for a five-bedroom house and so that, that family decides, well, my main structure, I want to do a three-bedroom and then I want to do a separate dwelling with a two-bedroom, then is everybody going to be doing that from now on? And does that two-bedroom structure, does it stay a short-term rental, or does it become a dwelling? I'm looking at the future. How do you handle that? Is that not a county determination at that point? As far as, as, far as septic. Oh, as far as septic goes, yeah. Okay, but so, and so anybody in that if it says it's good for five acres and they can just build both dwellings, do they have to determine that one at that time is going to be short-term rental? Or can they say they're both residential and then all of a sudden, hey, you know what? My kids are growing up, I want to rent that out. So the ADU and short-term rental use are two separate things. Right. That's you what I thought they were supposed to be. So yeah. I'm trying to see where... So when you make your determination as property owner that you want to rent it out, that's the point where your ADU becomes a short-term rental. So it has to be an ADU first. Well, before a short-term It's got to be on the requirement for an ADU yeah, first. Right. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. It can't go, it can't go the other way. It's got to be an ADU. It's got to be an ADU, ADU to be a thing. Yeah. And to be a short-term rental, it's got to be an ADU. So it could be a whole house. Well, yeah, right. the same way it is. Right. That's, but there's no restriction. That's a different That's a different element. But it's got to be ADU before it goes to the BOA for a special use permit. So in ADU, we, we use that as a classic example of like, you've got a garage and you finish upstairs to mom and dad. Right. That was the intent. Mom and dad passed away to move away, whatever. 
now you're in your job. And Johnny comes home from college and needs a place to crash for the summer or for the first 10 years of his life when he's out of college. I mean, that's, it has the apartment above the garage. I mean, that's an ADU. And in that type of, in that type of building is determined by the county, which I think is your question. How is that determined? But it still can't be any more than half of the main dwelling. But it's also attached. Right? Well, but you, he was referring to in the past, they used to be, well, I guess, in the garage, yeah. over the garage. Yeah. Well, that's the step that was hypothetical. Yeah. Right, right. I, I think about it sometimes, there are several detached garages or apartments above them for mom and dad or kids in college or whatever. And also remember the focus here for short-term rental is the designation is no more than 30 days. Right. Okay. So can you keep if if Reese want if Reese says kids grow up and they want to rent my bonus room or well, let's say it's attached, then can I rent that 30 days, 30 days, 30 days? How do, and how do you police that? And how do you know that it's being done on the other hand? Nothing against anybody here. I'm just asking, how do you follow up with that? How do you follow, how do you police everything? It's just correct. I might offer red and say it differently, but in my experience, zoning enforcement is complete driven. And lots of people, I mean, Ma'am, I know you said something before about the honor system, but once, and it kind of is an honor system, once you get your permits, I mean, there are lots of people who do stuff that the zoning ordinance doesn't allow, and as long as no one knows about it, no one finds out about it, you can do it. And if that's what, so zoning enforcement, you don't really have the zoning police out there looking in backyards and stuff like that, generally speaking. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you does it. Uh, unless someone, unless it's obvious, or unless someone points it out to, to the, 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 the zoning administrator, it may be hard to protect. Just like someone putting up a, a new little shed in the backyard that doesn't quite meet the setback. I mean, it's hard to detect that unless someone brings it to your attention and it is important. That happens. A lot. And just to clarify, that it happens even now, because we do allow short-term rental with an apartment residence. So, no. Right. Okay, one more question. Um, kind of, it might be more policing, but when you do like VRBOs or anything like that, there's fees and taxes, there's a fire tax, the county tax. Would there also be, well, I guess that the county tax and the town tax would be on the property, so that's already done. But would for policing and doing all this other stuff that the town ever get any of those fees? No. Just curious. It was a question that was asked. Unless the value of the property increases. We only get property tax. Right. There's occupancy taxes that like other towns collect. Like, no, we don't collect that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank